remember the definition of faith from last week? The assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen. We're going to keep going into Hebrews today and play with that some more. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God. Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I pray you all experience God's presence through the Holy Spirit in this time of worship. I'm Laurie Loveless, your liturgist, better known here as Scott's wife. Um, Would you all please stand and join me in the call to worship. The world belongs to God. How good it is, how wonderful. Love and faith come together. If Christ's disciples keep silent, open our lips, O God, and our mouth shall proclaim your grace. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for August the end of summer, for the change of pace, the slowing, for making it too hot to hurry. Thank you for brown-eyed daisies sunning themselves, turning their faces all day to get full color, lazy birds of prey kiting on the wind, noontime heat that sends living things under rocks, porches, trees, and sheds, long days, and short nights, clouds that drift in from the sea and disappear like winter breath, grass that turns brown, dust that turns the evening sun apple red, wary lizards looking for water, drinking the morning dew from leaves, corn browning in the field, chilled melons that sweeten friendship. Thank you, God, for quality life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
us still and waits in mercy to forgive. Trusting in the promises given at our baptism, let us confess our sin before God and one another together. Holy God, we ask for your help, your power, your spirit, so that we can amend our lives and grow more each day into the image of Christ. We confess that we fear what is different. We confess that it's easier to lock the doors of our community than to receive those who don't look like we look, love like we love, or vote like we vote. We confess that we have not lived out our call to share an abundant life and unconditional love. We believe that you have the power to turn us around to a more inclusive way of living. So we ask you to do that. We ask you to give us the courage to change. We ask that you give us the energy, intelligence, imagination, and love to be your people in all we say and do. Good deep breath in, and then let it back out slowly. Breathe in God's mercies for you, and breathe them out from you to others. Brothers and sisters, who is in a position to condemn us or judge us? Only Christ. And Christ saw where we were, how things were going, and left that place of privilege and came among us as one of us, showed us how to live, died, and rose again, and promises his forgiveness is forever. Holy Spirit is right beside us, and God's grace is more real than anything else. This is the center of the good news. May it be true for us and for all God's creation. Amen? says, I'm in heaven, 
like you said right there. And where else is God? Everywhere. God is everywhere on earth. That means that God is here in the sanctuary. And God is at home with you at the dinner table. God went with you on all your travels this summer, all over the country where you've been going. God's on the playground. Anywhere we go, we can find God there. How does that make you feel? Is that weird? What do y'all think? How does that make you feel to know that God is everywhere? Very what? I heard lots of things, but I didn't hear one voice. Somebody yell it out loud. Blessed. Blessed. Comforted. Happy. Happy. Safe. Safe. I feel all of those things. Sometimes I also feel like kind of nervous. You know, sometimes when you're just like, oh, I hope God's not here right now watching this happen. Or I hope God's not listening to this angry prayer. Sometimes it feels really good to know that God's always with us, and sometimes it weirds us out. So I have a challenge for you, Claire, for you and your family, and for everybody. At the end of each day this week, I want you to make a list of all the places you went that day and talk together about where do you think God was that day. How did you see God in those different places? And I bet you're going to start to notice that God really is everywhere. You think you can do that? Y'all think you can do that? Oh, yeah. Let's pray. Dear God, you are everywhere. In the places we go to, the places we've never heard of, and we trust that every person can know you are there with them forever. Amen. Thanks for hanging out. It's good to see you. Let us pray. Now prepare our hearts and minds, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence any voice inside us but your own, and inspire us in hearing to then obey your will. Through Jesus the Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our second scripture is Psalm 82, it's page 475 in your pew Bible. If you'd like to turn because we will read this psalm responsively. I'll read the odd verses and you will read the even. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. <clears throat> Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So last week, we heard the definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, 
conviction of things not yet seen, and I suggested the great thing that we have not yet seen in reality, but are invited to see in our minds and hearts is what the kingdom of God looks like when it comes. What the beloved community of love and justice and peace will look like here and now in our very lives. For us to see that and imagine it and hope for it and be assured of it and convicted to it, that would mean that the people of faith, the community of faith, like a church, would hold God's kingdom as our high, highest priority. It would mean in faith that we hope for it. It would mean in faith we are assured of its coming and its promises, not just for us, but for all of creation. It would mean that we're so convicted to it that we speak and act and move all things toward it, no matter what fear or resistance might be in front of us. Today's scripture continues that lesson from Hebrews 11 and rolls over into 12. Now, 12 you've seen before. You've seen it needle-pointed on pillows and printed on picture frames, and you've seen it memed on Facebook and Instagram. Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings to us and let us run with perseverance the race set before us. Have you heard that one before? Have you nodded that one? Did grandma quote that one to you when you were about to do something difficult? Now, in Hebrews, we are given examples of faith, what it looks like to lay aside the weight and the sin and what it looks like to run the race before we get to that quote. But we very seldom talk about those examples. So that's what we get to do today. We get to hear the examples the author used to connect the definition of faith to the invitation to faith. Let's pray. Here we come, God, into your word. May something about it move us, move in us and change us to look more like your faithful disciples who ran the race. Amen. Starting at Hebrews 11, 29, and going all the way to 12, 2. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they'd been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute didn't perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more could I say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, Samson and Jephthah, of David and Samuel and all the prophets who through faith they conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises. They shut the mouths of lions and quenched the power of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword and were made strong out of weakness and became mighty in battle and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured. They refused to accept release in order to obtain a better Resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains, imprisonment. Some were stoned to death, sawn in two, killed by the sword. Some went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented. Of them the world was not worthy. They wandered around in deserts and mountains and caves, even holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, they didn't receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made whole. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely to us and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. It's okay if you don't know all the stories mentioned here. It's okay. There are lots of small groups starting this fall. Just join one and you'll learn a few. But the author of Hebrews is writing to people who do know all these stories really well. So the letter isn't meant to reteach those stories. These people already knew the stories. The letter is meant to show through time what faith, what faithfulness looks like and to measure the benefits and costs of faithfulness, to redefine what faith means for them. They were getting confused about what faith looks like. Now the first story, you might know it. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, and when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. If not, Prince of Egypt, great movie, go home and watch it, the animated version. <laughs> Charlton Heston's, I'm not a fan, but Prince of Egypt, huge fan. Did I hurt your feelings? <laughs> Maybe you know this story. The people of God were once slaves of Egypt. They banded together and they walked out and Pharaoh's army chased them. And the story goes that God parted the waters and God's people, the, the Israelites, walked straight through. And when the Egyptians chased them, the waters crashed on them. The story might be faith walks toward freedom. No matter what's in front of you or behind you, and faith will escape. But if we pause and think about this story, and we know it the way they did, we know lots of children in faith never made it out of Egypt. They died serving as Egyptian slaves. We know lots of Egyptians didn't die in the Red Sea. They stayed behind and enjoyed the the buildings and benefits of Hebrew slave labor for generations. We know lots of children of Israel suffered even when they got to the other side of the sea. They suffered in the wilderness for at least two generations. They suffered for water. They suffered for meat. We know it took two generations to get through the wilderness on the other side before they ever made a home. Now, if we don't know this story well and we don't remember those kind of details, the story might imply that faith just give safe passage and protection. And sure, in the big picture, faith does do that. But for the ones in faith who wait for slavery to end or act to end the slavery, the benefits of faith didn't come soon enough for some. And for those who lived in the contentious moments when faith started to dismantle slavery, it wasn't safe, it was dangerous. It was hard work, it was struggle, it was risk. And there was no clear promise that anything would change or that they would even survive. But that's faith. The second example, the faithful arrive and capture Jericho thanks to walls falling down and insiders spying for them. Maybe you've heard the song, Joshua, built, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls. All right, you do know that one. <laughs> After slavery was wilderness, at least a couple generations, and the people of God emerged from wandering in wilderness for generations and found this city in this land they felt God had promised to them, and the story goes, they marched around the walls seven times and the walls fell and God gave them victory over all the people inside. The lesson might be, faith never stops looking for and walking toward God's promises and will receive them. Great. But if we know the story really well, like the people that the author was writing to, we know that people of faith died in the wilderness. Some did. We know some people of faith died in the battle for Jericho. We know that the wanderers eventually won the war and so got to write down the story as a victory for them. But inside that city were a bunch of people, other 
children of God who lost homes and families and their lives. When the wanderers heard God give them the right to enter that city, but also heard God say, and you're allowed to kill to have it. Is that how Jesus did faith? In faith, Jesus conquered kingdoms, but didn't have to kill anybody to do it. Now, these numerous other references are similar. Their stories are remembered as faithful, and there's this quick list. You can look them up. They're interesting, each one of them. In faith, those other names administered justice, obtained promises, avoided the mouths of lions. Daniel, lions did. Quenched the power of fire. <gasps> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace. They escaped the edge of the sword. They were made strong out of weakness. All these great examples of what faithfulness looks like. A time of suffering and struggle and survival. But then after that, the author of Hebrews begins to realize how one-sided these examples of faith are sounding. Real faith is not always successful. Real faith hurts and costs. So other examples are written in. Some in faith were tortured. Some in faith suffered mocking, flogging, chains, imprisonment. Some in faith were stoned or killed. Human beings are afraid to fight back against bullies. We're afraid to hold corrupt people with power, especially military power, violent power, accountable. We're afraid to risk our personal freedom or safety or wealth on behalf of communal safety, wholeness. And we're willing to ignore honor or truth if it's too big of a risk to us. We know if we do some of those things, we might end up mocked, we might end up injured. But human beings in faith, they do those things anyway. Now some in faith escape the sword, some in faith do not. Some in faith win their battles, other faithful never come home. Some in faith see Kingdoms overthrown and justice done. Others in faith never see justice done before their last sleep. In faith, some who didn't die went around in shabby clothes, skins of sheep and goats, destitute, mean broke, poor. Some people of faith were not popular. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Some people in faith were not popular. They weren't influencers. They didn't have 1.2 million Instagram followers. They were persecuted. Some people of faith, they weren't happy and positive. They were tormented. They were haunted by all the evil around them and the difference between what they saw in the world and what they knew the kingdom is meant to be. Some people of faith do not go through normal life as normal people and just fit in. They, they don't fit. They look weird. They wander in deserts and mountains or in caves and live in holes in the ground. Yet in the great ark of God, those folk are also remembered as the faithful. Wait, how are we supposed to tell the faithful? Isn't faith the people who are like successful and have everything together and everything's fine? Isn't that what faith looks like? I mean, if you have faith, everything's going to work out, right? Yes. If you have faith, everything is going to work out, but you might not get to see it. And it might hurt while you walk towards it. Faith isn't always successful or popular or smooth or stable or wealthy or beautiful. The only sign of faith is none of those things. The only sign of faith is the effort itself. The struggle, the conviction, the hope for kingdom to come. The words and the actions that help 
kingdom come. That pray, kingdom comes, and then speak and act to help kingdom come. No matter how hard it is. No matter if you ever get to see it. No matter what it costs you. And friends, or dollars, or popularity, or time. Even the stories that work out really well. Think back on the stories that we remember really well. They were very hard on the people of faith when they were going through it. The author is admitting and reminding us faith doesn't seem to be winning when you're in the middle of it. Imagine the Hebrews running towards a sea with chariots right behind them. You think they were smiling and happy? We're scared to death. What does faith look like when you're scared to death? Now we're ready to hear the verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside any weight and every sin that clings so closely to us and let us run with perseverance our race, the race that is set before us. See how that changes how we read that needlepoint meme? Who are these cloud of witnesses, the faithful, who dared walk away from any oppressive history to make a better society for all people? Who are the faithful? They are the ones who wandered into strange lands and survived on daily bread and water from rocks. Who are the faithful? They sacrificed and they suffered to knock down walls to overthrow corrupt kingdoms and to ensure peace and justice for all people. Who are the faithful? The ones who protested and put their bodies on the line to help kingdom come on earth as it is in the heavens. Who are the faithful? The ones who sacrificed and wandered and suffered, not just so they might get something better for themselves. Some of them never seem to get it. It didn't matter. They did it anyway. On behalf of us. The ones who came after them. The here's and the now's. Because they hoped in faith, somehow, by the grace of God, someday we all have it together. Can we lay aside the weights that prevent us from acting and struggling or even suffering? In faith, can we lay aside whatever sin that came before us or that is around us or that is our choosing? Can we lay aside the sin that clings to us that makes us too afraid to change or challenge things and that doesn't sacrifice for love and justice? Can we run the race of our time? The one that's set before us. We don't have to run their race. They ran it. But there are a cloud of witnesses. Can we run the race of our time, the one right in front of us, toward God's promise? No matter how afraid we are or what resistance we might face. That's what faith looks like. To God be all glory and honor now and forevermore. Amen.
standing as together we affirm our faith using this portion of the Heidelberg Catechism. What do you understand by the providence of God? How does knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? Your bulletin insert has prayers on one side, announcements and calendary things on the other. Let's look at the prayer side for now. These are some of the prayers that we know about in your church this week. We're going to add to it one for Matt Tickler. He was hospitalized at the end of last week, uh, and they have a, a procedure coming up this Wednesday. He'll be having surgery Wednesday. He's still in the hospital. They're taking care of him. It's all heart stuff. So my goodness for Alice and Matt and that family. Uh, love on them and check on them and see how the church can take care of them through this. Another one just added um, in the book was healing prayers for Phoebe Zinkas, Zin, um, Zin Con something. She broke her ankle in Malawi. Oh, that's who that is. Yes, thank you. Zin Kambani. All right, what others? Please. Healing for Salman Rushdie. Yes, Salman Rushdie. What else, Brian? Mom? Yeah. Mom and, and the wider family. You're on the big prayer list, buddy. We're, we're going to remember that. Who else? Okay. My family. Sorry? My family. Ah. I was in the Outer Banks last week with 25 other family members, and many of them have COVID, including Dan. Family vacations. It was fine. <laughs> All right. Y'all help me pray. I'm going to leave some room. I invite you. Scream it out loud so that I can hear you and so I can repeat it for those who are at home. Right? Don't be shy in the prayer. Let, let, say it loud enough so we can hear it together. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. We come to you in prayer this morning and we hold open our hands and our hearts as we think back on those who showed us and taught us faith. Who do you remember that showed you and taught you faith? Parents. Sorry? Parents. Parents, thank you. Friends. My grandmother who lost both sons and her husband, but knew she was healed. A grandmother who lost both sons and a husband. School. Yes, thank you. Dad. Dad? Dad. Staff. Sunday school teachers. Sunday school teachers. These witnesses who came before us showed us how to live. They weren't you, but they tried to walk like you. Sometimes it looked gracious and amazing. Other times it looked hard, and yet they kept walking. We are honored 
to have their witness go before us. Deanne Jones. That's exactly where I was going, Brian. Who in the world today, who around you today, is speaking and acting and moving things toward kingdom with such faith that you can't help but notice and be in awe? Who around this world or your community or your own family do you consider the faithful today? Marty Hawkins. Autumn. Thank you. The staff. Look wider. Where else do you see it in the world? People of Ukraine. Jesus. Jesus. He is everywhere. Caitlin says so. A face that came to my mind today is Malala. People helping the sick. And the poor. Brother Leon, who visits the ones in prison. Jeff Davis. God, these are our witnesses today. We don't pause often enough and think of them, look towards them, and imagine what their words and actions of faith look like, nor do we pause often enough to imagine how they suffer for you. Are we willing to walk beside them, walk with them in those beautiful ways and in those suffering ways. Give us courage, God. We beg you. We have a list of prayer requests that are local and nearby right here in this church. If that's as far as we have faith, then fine. Send us to them. If our faith stretches us beyond those borders, we have another list that goes to friends and family that reaches outside of just Chestertown. Fine, we'll reach there. And if we hear you calling us to do something wider or farther, so be it. In faith, we are afraid. If we weren't afraid, it wouldn't be faith. If we didn't doubt a little, there'd be no room for faith to have its power. But here we come, God, praying to you, looking in our mind and heart for your promised kingdom, trying to find assurances that it is real already and it is coming with great speed we are begging you for the courage to act with conviction and to trust your kingdom is coming. That's why you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father. would like to share with the congregation, I invite you to come to the pulpit down here on the floor so that everyone can hear you.
So Friday at 6.30 at Minari Stream Alliance on American Legion Road, all the men of the church are invited to come for the first of four monthly talks and discussions. Thank you. I'd like to announce that uh, the existing choir members will have their first rehearsal September the 10th at 10 o'clock in the choir room. And we welcome new members. If you'd like to uh, come see me, if you'd like to sing with the choir, uh, there's a little audition I, I hold. It's not painful. So uh, we can do a five minute audition and see where we go from there. September 10th at 10, and our first service will be September 11th. Nice. So I remind you, as Scott did, of those announcements on the back of the page, a few more things there for you to take note of. Mindful of all of the abundance we have received in Christ, we offer ourselves and our gifts to the world. If you have something to give back to the church, don't forget about this tear-off insert. If there's something you want to share with us, something you want to volunteer for, make sure you fill that out and leave it in the offering plate.
might bring hope to those who despair, might feed those who hunger for hope as well as food, and might gather them into your community of wonder and joy. Amen. Please take note that in two Sundays there's a um, congregational meeting to elect elders and deacons. Woohoo! We announced that last week too. So it's coming. It's just around the corner. Also, as you exit into the narthex, look left into the fellowship hall. There's a table with sign up sheets and books and descriptions of all the small groups that start in the fall. And we hope you'll stop by and look at those. And if you're interested, grab a book and sign up so we can add you to the list. <clears throat> Well, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And now we know what it looks like. It's not beautiful and smooth and elegant and graceful. It's messy. Have you ever read Mother Teresa's own words about her own faith? You should look that up one day. She was absolutely sure that she wasn't making a difference. She was absolutely sure she should have done more, that this was silly, this is ridiculous, why am I here? She battled it. Even she didn't know it was faith at the time. But we do. It's the same with you and me. That wacky thing that brings love and peace and justice. Take a chance. Do it. We'll back you up. We're family. Now, blessing, laughter, and loving be yours. May the love of a great God who names you and holds you as the earth turns and flowers grow be with you this day, this night, this moment, and forevermore. Amen. All right, Steph's about to give up on this song, y'all. He's about to give up on it. He's like, I don't think they're getting it. I said, they're just not there yet. They're going to get it. Y'all got it today, right? Let's let it rip, buddy.